It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 686 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. I have a fun show lined up for you today. Joining me as my guest is Amy Franco. Amy is a sales and leadership keynote speaker and author of the new book titled The Modern Seller, Sell More and Increase Your Impact in the New Sales Economy. Now, today we're going to be focusing in part on sales enablement. Now, sales enablement is one of the areas of sales that is deservedly getting much more attention. After all, it's about what are you doing as a company to enable your sellers or to put your sellers in a position to win more frequently? So among the topics that Amy and I are going to explore include how to build sustainable sales enablement in any organization, why that process needs to start at the very top, why you need to get senior management, CEO buy-in, even build a case a business case for sales enablement and how to do that. I mean, Amy has written about this, and I think it's really interesting that you have to build a case, a business case for sales effectiveness. But given the poor returns that many companies have received on their sales training, you can see why this is very important. So you want to listen in on that. We're also going to dig into Amy's new book, The Modern Seller, and she's going to share the details about the five key criteria that she's determined that define a modern seller. So lots of great information here for you today. Now, before we get to Amy, I just want to share with you what's happening this week in the sales house. That's the B2B Sales Learning and Development Accelerator. We have a sales masterclass with our guest, John Wibben. John is the founder of Content Launch, and he's a leading expert in generating new sales leads through content marketing. He's going to share his best practices for small and mid-sized businesses to effectively use content marketing as part of their overall strategy. In our nine-minute sales academy, I'm teaching the ask, don't tell habit. This is In nine minutes, I'll show you how to turn your pitches into questions that lead to incredibly effective sales conversations with your buyers. We've got our two live coaching hours, our live pipeline cover coaching hour on Wednesdays, and our live sales mentoring hour on Thursdays, and our live workshop this week. Our guest is David A. Fields, very interesting guest, author of The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients. Subject of our workshop this week is seven words that turn contacts into clients. And David's going to share his key strategies on how to increase your close rate. So make sure you don't miss this. If you want to join in, make sure you visit thesaleshouse.com forward slash join. That is thesaleshouse.com forward slash join. We'll make sure to see you in the house. All right, here we go. Amy Franco, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So uh, you're joining us from Columbus, Ohio. Yep, I sure am. Are you a Buckeye fan? Of course, I'm a Buckeye fan, although I grew up in Cleveland and uh, I moved to Columbus 20 years ago. And so I didn't go to Ohio State, but you you become a Buckeye fan. I know, right? (laughs) I went to the University of Dayton. Go Flyers. Go Flyers. uh, You become a Buckeye fan through uh, osmosis just by living here. (laughs) So what time we're recording this, it's not exactly clear who the coach is going to be this year at Ohio State. Uh, By the time it airs, I think it will have been resolved. So what do you think? We'll see how we'll see how accurate your your prediction is. Okay, so so my prediction urban is or not urban. That's okay. my prediction. You think urban will be back? Okay. Yeah. All right. So either urban or exurban. So yeah, I don't I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't care one way or another. But <laughs> so um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about sales enablement because yeah. uh, again, as recording this, the big. Uh, annual sales enablement society meeting or i guess the big one in denver coming up next month and uh you had written an article about making the internal case the internal business case for sales enablement (laughs) and on the surface of it it, to me it's like you have to make a business case about enabling sales it's like uh that's like making the case for breathing isn't it i mean it's it's uh Seems a lot out of whack. So (laughs) tell me, tell me where I'm missing things. Well, so I think like anything, there are so many priorities in any given organization that making the case for sales enablement is as important as making the case for building out your sales team or put putting the putting the right talent in the right place. And but is it a trade off? I mean, don't you have to do all of it? Yes, you do. And sales enablement is 
encompasses all of that, in my opinion. Mm. And sales enablement is somewhat of a new phrase in a lot of organizations. And depending how mature you are in your sales functions and sales talent, being able to earn a seat at the, uh, at the CEO table, if you will, and make a case for the initiatives that you need to bring forward. I, I see that quite a bit. So let me ask you a question. Is, is there's um, yeah, relatively broad agreement, and certainly some people that avidly disagree, but in certain <laughs> quarters, broad agreement that one of the, if you consider the, the triad of sales enablement, typically as people talk about, is training, coaching, content uh, delivered via technology, to, you know, at the right time throughout the buyer's journey, yada, 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 that, that perhaps one of the more important components of a sales training is, is not very effective, right? Not really serving its purposes in a lot of cases. And, you know, really being given sort of token lip service by, by most companies. So it seems like the challenge is great. What we're doing is we're, we're now going to enable sales. We're not just going to train them. We're going to enable them. And, you know, you run into these CEOs who, even by surveys that I've read, say, I think like 80% of CEOs say we don't find any value in, in sales training. Yeah, it's got to be hard, I guess, then to make the case to say, yeah, it's not working, but we're going to do something even better. And understanding what uh, what your definition of sales enablement is in your organization. Um, training is one element of sales enablement. Mm-hmm. Um, it could also encompass your talent acquisition strategies, even your compensation strategies. Uh, but I see training as, as one element of sales enablement, for sure. Yeah, well, I was talking about just one of three. I mean, most commonly, I mean, I, I, a couple months ago, I went and did a bunch of research online, see what people are writing about. And generally, the three consistent things we could talk about is, you know, the content, coaching, training. Um, so I just want to, you know, given sort of the history of how the training is something that, yeah, we're going to do once a year. We'll hire somebody like Andy to come in or somebody like Amy to come in, yeah. you know, give a talk. And, yeah, we check the box. It's done. Why do we think it's going to be different with sales enablement? Well, it can be different with sales enablement if you are looking at the big picture strategy and what the specific skills, goals, outcomes are for your organization. And then how do you make it sustainable? Because exactly to your point, if you Mm -hmm. hire me or hire you, we come in and give a keynote or we do a one day training event and there is, it's not tied to anything outcome related. Mm -hmm. There is no follow up after the fact. It's not part of a longer term trajectory. Then it just becomes an event in time. Yeah. So how do we prevent that from, from happening? Because I mean, to me, the there's broader issues we'll, we'll get into, but I mean, it, it's, it seems like it's sales that always sort of suffers first, right? When when things sort of go bad, we cut back on the training, we cut back on this, and and it's nice to put a you know new face on it and have a more comprehensive strategy. As you said mm-hmm. sometimes even encompassing talent acquisition and so on, but yeah, you know, it's like a lot of things in sales. We put a new face on it, like you know account based marketing to some degree. You, know, you talk to people, it's like, yeah, we put a new name on it, but we're sort of doing the same things we've always were doing. Uh sometimes not always doing well. So how do we prevent that from happening? Well yeah, so so if I'm in if I'm in that role in an organization where I'm charged with sales enablement, mm-hmm. the first way that I'm going to prevent it from happening is by building the relationships across the organization that I need. Um, whether it's at a C-level, whether it's the VP of sales actually with the field or what the sales roles are mm-hmm. and understand what they need, what their obstacles are and understand where the business is going. That's going to be the first thing that I do because anything else I build out from there has to be tied back to what's most important to the business. So that that's where I'm going to start. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to look at all the different elements of sales, sales enablement across the enterprise, training being one of them, and understanding what's working, what's not working. And you know, we have to get rid of what's not working and understand what's going to be most important for the different roles in the organization. And sometimes I think we make it more complicated than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Well, and, undo- and, and, undoubtedly, right? We, know, do that, and, we do that and, with sales, so yes. Oh, for sure. Right. So, so what are the top 
two, th- two or three things that I need to accomplish in the sales enablement role that is going to make a meaningful impact to the business and then deliver on those and try to try to strip away the other things and keep it simple, keep it focused. Well, in your experiences, so what's, what's most often missing? Oh, you know, I think what's most often missing is the very practical application of what you do. So if we take sales training as one element of um, sales enablement, the practical implementation and from at the field level and feedback from the field on what's working and what's not working. Mm-hmm. I've been through a number of sales trainings in, in my own career mm-hmm. and I love the ideas that I learn, but I'm not always out there applying them. I'm not, I'm not applying them to my opportunities. I'm not seeing results and therefore I'm not going to continue doing them. So, so to me, there, there's a, there's a Mm -hmm. missing component from moving to the learning piece of it, to the application piece, and then the feedback loop back to back to sales enablement or sales Mm -hmm. training to make sure it's the right, right content, right application. No, I think that's a great point. I, I, as people who listen to the show will know, is is I really think there's a missing leg in enablement, which is we don't talk about educating our salespeople. You know, we don't. I don't believe that you can really train someone on some of the sort of fundamental relationship building and and basic behaviors and habits you need to have. I think it's more a matter of uh because it's so personal about how people implement them to your point that you really need to we don't really teach people the why behind the how and that, to me that's a huge gap that exists right now it's existed forever but i mean it's it's becoming more painfully obvious at least to me now and, and a number of other people is that yeah we're training people on a process we're training people on a methodology and then we're turning them loose to your point and right. they don't really understand why this works, why this would make sense to a buyer, why it makes sense to them to do it. And, and we seem to have lost some of the thread too about how we uh, educate our sellers in such a way for them to develop their own skills, unique skills and capabilities because certainly certain market segments, training is really about compliance. Right? Well, right. It's, a, it's a box checker in a, in a lot of in a lot of environments for sure. But even what they're training on is compliance. Mm-hmm. And, and I use the phrase that I didn't originate it, but I, I love it is, you know, we train pets, we educate people and there's nothing that really takes place in the sales world. And I think oftentimes in business to say, right, it's really important that we set aside time for learning, right? Not, not training, learning. And when we talk about it, we get a lot of pushback because it's like, no, 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 no. Just training, I understand, right? Go do these three things. But learning, that seems a little squishy. And I don't have time for that. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and back to your point about the why. Um, and especially when we are learning, learning a process, learning a framework, we're coming into some kind of, of learning event, training event, and we're there because we have to be. Um, but understanding understanding that why and why do I even want want to be there? is I do think that that is a missing element. And even with with process-related training, not all elements of the process apply to my given sales situation or my different clients, my my specific client situation. (laughs) So so selecting the elements that are going to work for that situation and applying those and being able to filter out the things that aren't going to work in my situation. Yeah. No, I was just smiling because as you were saying it, you're sort of whispering it like somebody may overhear you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's not a secret. People get this here. And now it's, it's really something we need to be shouting out because I think that, yeah, you know, we have this, the, we have a mix of generations in the sales world these days, ranging from, you know, people are too comfortable, perhaps uh, operating their comfort zones and other people that aren't being pushed out of their comfort zones as well. And so the, the newer cadre where yeah, you know, they're much more comfortable um, dealing you know, through digital technology with customers as opposed to in person or face to face and so on. And and uh, those are skills that you know need to be learned and behaviors that need to be learned, and they're not being taught. 
And I think this is this is this is a big big issue. I think right now, uh, you know, I just consider how I was trained. I was worked for a large multi billion dollar multinational company, and we certainly had a process. But once we were out in the field making calls, you know, managers really took it upon themselves to coach you how to become the best version of you possible. Whereas now it's like, yeah, but did you make your twenty calls today? Or did you make your fifty emails? Or didn't? And it's we just want compliance. We we don't want you to break the rules. I wrote about this this week uh, in my my newsletter on LinkedIn. Is that yeah? The research is pretty clear. The people that succeed, they break the rules. And to your point about the the leadership piece, mm. having the right sales leader makes all the difference. And I, that may sound so obvious, but I can't tell you how many conversations I have with sales professionals. I've had my own experiences with bad leaders and that can absolutely make or break, make or break what you're doing out in the field. That, that relationship with your leader, in Mm -hmm. my opinion, is so critical. Yeah. Well, I mean, it gets to this idea of, of really your, your immediate boss, most often just being a mentor, and I think you know we're we're now so uh, yeah bought into this idea that everybody's got a coach, and we know coaching is still a rarity, even on the the you know, frontline sales manager level with their their direct reports. But to me, there's there's another level, which is really the mentorship, right? I mean, coaching is really about the tactical, right? I'm gonna. Day to day, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to make, you know, we're going to work through your your deals. I give you suggestions. Try this. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Da 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 da. Whereas what we're not doing is saying, look, there's this whole other level, which is mentorship, which is we're looking after you as the person, right? What do you need to become the best version of you possible? Where where do you think you're missing uh, skills or you know knowledge or information? Um, you know, how many companies? I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Yeah, you know, how many companies sit with their sales team and say, "Okay, look, yeah, we're going to have a sales plan for this year. You're also going to have a learning plan for the year, right? Some people call them development plans and so on, but learning plan for the year. I mean, virtually none. And I I would agree with you on that. And the the other piece to that is one of the things that helped me to be successful early on in my career mm-hmm. um, in my sales role was I sought out mentors. I, I did not wait for them to be a, a quote unquote assigned to me. Oh, I, I agree. hundred percent. Yeah. I think about my, I think about my first uh, sales career at IBM. I had two mentors um, who I sought out and I shadowed them. I went on calls with them. I mean, to this day, it, 18 years later, I still have a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. I still talk to them and they made such a difference in my life. But the point is, is that I sought them out. I did not wait for them to be assigned to me. And also the learning piece, actively seeking out your own learning if you are not in an organization that has formal learning paths created. I agree. And you have to do that. I mean, in an ideal world, just the companies would take responsibility for it not just training, but education as well. And yep. uh, try to start a movement about that. I mean, this is something I'm really passionate about because especially in sales, I actually have a program that I have clients that have run where I put together a, a year-long learning program for them. And <laughs> when I talk to some companies about it, it's like, no, we don't have time. You know, when the program is what it lays out is 30 minutes a day, you're going to set aside for learning. And... Oh, yeah, we don't have time. And then you start to run through the math. Well, okay, well, what percentage of your time is your reps actually selling? Well, we all know. The research, it hasn't changed in years. So it's been decades. We, salespeople spend about a third of their time actually selling. Okay, what do you do with the rest of your time? You don't have time to learn in the rest of the time? Oh, we want to make those other hours available. Well, <laughs> you can push, try push that wet noodle up the hill all you want. That's never <laughs> changing, right? So the time exists. And so... Whether it's learning, or as you talk about mentorship, you know, I think the thing with mentorship is you're right. Is I think you sort of have to you can't really be assigned a mentor. You sort of have to choose your mentor because that is such a personal thing. But on the other hand, we're not training managers that part of your responsibility is to be a mentor as well. 
because it's a different role. You know, we're not looking at that whole person. So how do we develop this entire person to you know live up to the best of their potential, be the best they can be? Because again, there's a whole body of research coming out about quote unquote greatness and success. And yeah, people start coalescing on certain caps around a definition of greatness as being, well, just being the best version of you possible. And we're not really encouraging that. So I want to segue because I think it plays into another topic because you've got a new book coming out by the time yeah. this airs, the new book will be out. It's called The Modern Seller. So what is a modern seller? This is, this is an interesting topic for me. Yep. So the, the way that I define a modern seller is I look at it twofold. A modern seller is a, they're a differentiator and they are a leader. So from the differentiator standpoint, a modern seller is someone who is recognized and acknowledged by their clients and, and even prospects as someone who makes a difference in their business. It's one, to th one thing to think that we are a differentiator. It's another thing entirely to be acknowledged and recognized as that person. Okay. So, so that, that, that's the first piece of it. Um, the second piece of that differentiation is that um, it's as if the products or services that you sell, you elevate the value of those products or services so that you really can't be eliminated from that equation. They just aren't as valuable without you as part of that equation. So, so that's the other piece of differentiation that I think makes the case for why we need modern sellers today. Well, so, well, give me an example of that last one, because it sounds like what you're sort of <laughs> treading on is this idea of being irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one of the modern tenets of business is they're based replaceable. And certainly in sales, I've seen that to be the case. I mean, I, I'm never seen a case, never, almost never seen a case in 40 years of sales where... Uh, yeah, ever made sense to hire someone because of their Rolodex, quote unquote? If people remember Rolodex, is you know their list of contacts, uh, <laughs> you know the things that spin a little spindle that spun around, right? Yep. <laughs> I'm with you. I thought it was still generic enough that people understand, but <laughs> but yeah, that those relationships don't really transfer very well in most cases. You know, they're changing industries, you're changing companies. So too is yeah, I, you. <laughs> We've all left companies that were have sure. the customers are extremely loyal to you and and uh, you know customers have bought invested millions and millions of dollars with me, but you know they happily worked with the next person that came along when I moved on to the the next thing I did so so explain that last part in a way that that I guess deals with that sort of scenario so you know life changes people change. Sure, sure. And and that's not to say life doesn't change. You don't find another opportunity that you you want to pursue. Um on the on the point about relationships, what's what I've seen that's interesting is um I've seen some scenarios and increasingly more often where people who are interviewing for sales roles are asked to bring their contacts with them and actually show where they have built relationships, especially if you're moving from in, into like industries, where they are actually asked to show what relationships they have with decision makers and what they're going to be doing in their first 30, 60, 90 days on the job. And so, uh, <laughs> now, I didn't ask your opinion on this beforehand, but I'll just say companies do that absolutely crazy because... My experience, again, working in large accounts, oftentimes. Yeah, once you leave and come back in a different uniform, so to speak, representing a different company, for the most part, all bets are off. I mean, it's, yeah, you may be able to get a meeting, but I've rarely seen that translate into meaningful business. Um, doesn't mean people aren't successful sometimes at some of those accounts, but it's more in the virtue of who they are versus inherent relationship that came along with them. I mean, I've seen so many mistakes with companies that have made hiring based on that. And it's usually a mistake. Well, we, the, the opposite end of that spectrum is somebody who is in, in, I'm sure we've all experienced this where, or we've seen it in some way, shape or form where someone talks about the relationships that they have and they interview well mm -hmm. and they look great on paper and they, they come in the door and they don't have one relationship. They can't make any progress 
and they're a bad hire. Oh, I agree. Um, yeah. So. But, but I think it's I think the odds are just as likely there'll be a bad hire, even if you verify the relationships. I'd rather validate that they actually achieved not the relationships, but they actually achieved what they said they achieved, or that they're actually capable of doing what they say they're able to do. I mean, that's that's you're right. There's we got all this big <laughs> big yawning gap when it comes to validating or verifying what people say they can do or what they have. Um but to me, I just yeah, <laughs> looking at the relationships, that's probably the least valuable of those, I think, if I were a hiring manager, because, you know, they just don't translate very well. But I, interesting. I mean, I, the differentiation part, I think, is huge. And I, you know, I think the differentiation occurs on so many levels that, yeah, it starts on the first sales call. Mm-hmm. And if you can differentiate on a personal level and then as a professional level, in terms of the insights and knowledge you can help the customer with, yeah, you're golden. That's that's a great place to be. But but when you say it's modern, it's I mean, to me that's I'm not young by a stretch of imagination. I still consider myself very modern. But that's always been the case in my sales career. Yeah, you know, I sold lots and lots of stuff. And um it's that's how I that's how I won. So what what's inherently modern about that? So, so I want to come back to your the other question that that you asked, mm-hmm. which was about the the connection about elevating that value and being really connected to the product or service that you sell. And and where I was going with that is, it's so easy to get commoditized or to be viewed in, in a commoditized way. There's yes. so much choice out there yep. um, on the part of our prospects or clients. And so the, the idea is, is that whatever we're selling, whatever product or whatever service, I mean, I, I sold, I, I sold a commodity. I sold PCs, laptops, tablets. Um, I, I sold a product that you can buy in so, so many different places and even more so now. Mm-hmm. And so when I talk about being, being connected to the product or service that I sell is being that person who doesn't just look at themselves as selling the product or service, but part of my job is to make your business run better and to bring you ideas and bring you insights mm-hmm. and connect myself in a way to my products or services yes. that I make it harder for you to make a decision to go somewhere else. Three, a thousand percent. I mean, I had yeah, written about this in my first book, uh, Zero Time Selling, is that and this was 2011, as I sort of wrote in 2010, which was already at that point, given how rapidly technology was changing and how <laughs> little time you had to maintain any sort of meaningful product differentiation with any sort of new release, yeah, every product's basically a commodity, right? And yeah, you as a salesperson, you're the first line of differentiation in nearly every sales situation. And yeah, and especially, as you said, in the, put a premium on that when you're in more commoditized industries. Yeah, how do you add value as a salesperson? Because the more commoditized the, the field is, inherently the less value the channel has and starts becoming more of a price. So yeah, I think that's. I think that is an element of modern selling that I think people are overlooking. I think it's a great idea you're bringing that out. Is is not just differentiation because you need to differentiate competitive, but us in a heavily commoditized world where there's less perceived value in the channel itself um, becomes important. And 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 coming back to your question about so 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 why what makes this modern differentiation or being a leader what what makes this modern so that that's how I define a modern seller. And Mm -hmm. then what I dig into are, there are these five dimensions that, that I believe sellers have that make them modern, that they develop, that make them modern, that go beyond the, um, you know, the, the skills of, well, let's, let's, let's go through them. What are the, what are the five things? So they are agile, entrepreneurial, holistic, social, and ambassador. Okay. All right. All right. The goal here was to dig into some of the skills behind the skills. There are lots of great books out there about prospecting, presenting, closing, negotiating, et cetera. And so I did not want it to be a book about those types of topics, but what are the things that can actually make us better at those activities and help us become more effective, more efficient at those activities Mm -hmm. and elevate ourselves, separate separate ourselves from other sellers and the, these are the five dimensions that uh, that I'm digging into that I think can elevate us above the rest. All right, let's 
go through them more slowly. Yep. First one. Agile. Agile, meaning? So if you are agile, you are someone who is a fluid thinker, a continuous learner, back to your point about mm -hmm. education versus training, um, someone who deals really well with ambiguity. We live in a world of ambiguity, so much information, so much choice. If you can filter through all that ambiguity and make really good decisions, mm -hmm. confident decisions, you are someone who is agile and, okay. you, and you live in this growth mindset. All right. Boy, you packed a lot into that one. Um, yep. <laughs> that, that could be a book right there. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Um, yeah, the, someone's tolerance for ambiguity, I think is, is one of the, one of the benchmarks that they need to, to get on top of because it's, yep. it's, um, it's so very important. Okay. So agile, love that. Okay. Next one. That's entrepreneurial. So uh, people who are modern sellers don't just see themselves as employees. They see themselves as the founder and the CEO and the chief bootstrapper of their book of business or their territory. Okay. And that is an entirely different level of ownership than just seeing yourself as an employee who runs a territory. All right. So here's a question about that is yeah. that's how I was brought up in the business. So this is, you know, again, decades ago and and certainly part of the reasons I stayed in sales is this, this sense of control over what I was doing, right? Yeah. Um, but we certainly have wide swaths of the sales world these days, especially in the SaaS business and companies that are heavily inside sales where you've got your SDRs, your highly fragmented roles, where that's not at all. They don't even own an account. So how in those environments can these people become entrepreneurial? Yeah. So, so if I'm someone who's in a leadership role um, and I'm looking at my team of the, those types of roles, those SDRs, et cetera, um, uh, looking for what can make somebody stand out as someone who's entrepreneurial, it may be bringing a brand new idea or brand new way of thinking to your, your role or to an account. Um, it could be you're someone who has a, has a vision for mm -hmm. how you can grow an account mm -hmm. or grow the role. Um, so there, there's some, there's definitely some leeway and some creativity around your thinking and around your vision for yourself and your role. And even if you, those aren't entrepreneurial roles, being, being a visionary is one of the top skills that entrepreneurs bring and entrepreneurial sellers can bring. Okay, so a little bit back to the abundance mindset as well. So, uh, okay, we've got agile, we got entrepreneurial. I'm trying to remember these things. Go. Holistic is the third one. Meaning? Meaning that we have a finite amount of time, energy, motivation, discipline in any given day. Mm -hmm. And the choices that we make about how we invest those resources directly impacts the results that we have. So this is about the modern seller really looking at how they're investing these types of, you know, intangible resources, if you will, mm -hmm. to create the right results. Okay. So this is, this is value over volume. This is quality over quantity. It, it's also looking at your performance. <laughs> Again, much of that anathema to, to broad segments of the sales world these days, but yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and, and I also look at it as um, looking at your individual performance and how your individual performance is going to create results. So your performance and your activities are those leading indicators mm -hmm. and how we invest in those leading indicators Creed determines the results we're going to get. Okay. So agile, entrepreneurial, holistic. Social. Social. Okay. Yep. So the idea behind social is that, um, you know, social capital, not a line item you're going to see on a PL, mm. but, you know, modern sellers, they invest in their networks, they invest in their relationships because that's how they create results. Um, and and so, interesting, an interesting point here, though, for people too is is modern does it really has nothing to do with age. I, mean, I want to make that very clear because right on because there's you know again broad swaths of the uh, the sales world these days that somehow think it is, and we'll get into that in a second. 
and to your point here about social is yeah, there's been studies that come out that of LinkedIn usage where they actually show that uh, boomers are actually the most effective at cultivating and getting results out of their LinkedIn networks than millennials. Millennials may connect more easily. Boomers are connecting more deeply. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Social. Love it. Last one. Last one's ambassador. The idea behind ambassador, I think of ambassadors as a bridge. So in, in a global sense, an ambassador is a bridge between countries and cultures. In modern selling, I see ambassadors as bridges between themselves and their organizations, prospects and clients out into the industry and the community. And there's someone who embodies the values of their organization, mm -hmm. but they also very uniquely stand in their own brand. Um, and they are also really phenomenal at taking an initial win and turning that into loyalty and, and hopefully very long-term lifetime value. Um, di different mindsets than going in and churn and burn and win, win a transaction and move on. It, it's taking that initial win and turning it into something much more valuable. Very interesting. Well, good. So that book comes out in September. And it does, yeah. we'll make sure to have you back on when the book comes out and I've had a chance to read it and we can talk about it in more depth. Fantastic. All right. Well, Amy, I appreciate you spending the time. It's been fantastic. So tell folks how they can get in contact with you. The best way to get in contact with me, uh, LinkedIn, Amy Franco or uh, amyfranco.com. And that's F-R-A-N-K-O. Yes, it is. All right. Amy, thank you very much. Thank you. Great conversation. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, I want to thank you for joining me, as always, and I want to thank my guest, Amy Franco. Join me again next week as I welcome Nathan Regier to the show. Nathan is CEO of Next Element Consulting and author of the book titled Conflict Without Casualties, a field guide for leading with compassionate accountability. Very interesting book. So before you go, don't forget to check out The Sales House, your all-in-one sales learning, coaching, mentoring, and development accelerator just for B2B sellers and sales leaders. Visit thesaleshouse.com. Look forward to seeing you there. So thanks again for joining me. Until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. <laughs>